Let's ask God today as I go forward in this message, what is your will for me? What is your word to me? God has set aside this day. This is a special day. Praise the Lord. I will mention several scriptures, but I will be reading shortly from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. The Lord seems to be taking me on a journey of spiritual discovery. I'm preaching things I've never preached before. The Lord is leading us towards being open to gifts. Which I believe are the key. Just accepting what the Lord wants to give us is the key to the revival that we have prayed for. You have gone through the steps. You, you got, when you were, had been without a pastor, you got a pastor. You had already built a building that we're trying to finish up for the Lord's use. We have recently, finally, gotten a pianist and also her, her husband who is so, so willing to, to work and so eager. I appreciate Brother Chuck. And we put things in place. We made sure that we were being accountable to the church itself in our annual report. We'll do that again when the time comes this May. And... In, in so many ways, put things in place for growth, and in fact, we hope and pray revival. And yet, having those things in place, what is needful is to go on and grow spiritually, accept things spiritually. And I'll, I'll be telling you, as on the course of things, some things that I've had revealed to me lately. The oh, I will mention. I've had, I, know I, I did say before that I had, have had, been, had a great spirit of prayer come upon me. And I, I think that I've spoken in tongues more in recent weeks than ever in my life. I come in here and of course I have access to have this house of God to myself at times. Where I don't have to worry about what people think. Don't have to edit what I say. And thank God I just come in here and meet with God and let it flow as best I'm able. The Holy Spirit is what brings God king, God's kingdom. And you know, we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. God's kingdom is the place in which all of God's will is always done. The realm of the Holy Spirit. There are also some places where God's will is not done. We see in Scripture... Isaiah 65, 2, God said to His people, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. That's our own dreams, like I was thinking about. Jeremiah 2, 13 refers to cisterns, which are places of water storage like a well. But... To Jeremiah, through Jeremiah, God says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Living waters being the Holy Spirit. And hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. How often we see people try to provide their own way, their own answers, instead of getting God's answers. And we all know the time when Jesus approached Jerusalem and He paused and He, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and you would not. You would not. God calls us together. And God wants to speak to us of his purpose. God has a purpose for each of us as well as this church as a whole. And as I've been saying, what God purposes is as good as done before we see it happen. It's as good as done if we don't fail to believe and obey like God's people I read about a while ago. 
What God says, John 14, 14, this is Jesus actually, He says, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's His purpose. What He purposes to do when we ask things in His name. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Isaiah said, Isaiah 46, verse 9, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. We can believe God. When we hear His voice, that He will do what He promises. Our role is to believe and obey what we believe, what we have been given to believe. God often gives us things to believe, and that's what I'm leading to. But I want to read part of the, or mention the passage in Acts 27. This is verse 25. When the Apostle Paul was being taken back to Rome, a prisoner, and they were assaulted by a, a great storm at sea. And everyone gave up all hope, except Paul spoke up. And he said that night an angel had stood beside him and told him there would be, be no loss of life, but they would be washed onto a certain island. Even Paul, I noticed, who was so used by the Holy Spirit, needed an angel to come. As I've said, God sends an angel when we when he's not getting through to us and he wants to enact his purpose, make it happen, and really get through to us, he sends sometimes an angel. I've never seen an angel, but I've heard words from the Lord. And what did Paul say? In spite of the storm that he saw and all the despair of all the people and all his natural despair he would naturally feel, he said, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. I believe God. In spite of all the winds and the waves around, in spite of all the doubts of other people, because people can't have your faith and they will cause you to doubt. In spite of all that, he had heard from God and he said, I believe God. Like I read once before about a quote from Smith Wigglesworth, early Pentecostal, he said, You'll recall, I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what I feel. I am moved by what I believe. That's what God calls us to, to believe. Belief is the, the currency of the kingdom. It's what makes God's kingdom work. He calls on the church to obey His gospel. And to obey, we must believe. If we believe that we honor God, if we fail to believe, we don't serve God. But if we believe, God will use us. God chooses to work through the church, not to send angels to call people to repent. Not until Revelation chapter 14 does it say an angel is sent to the world to call them to repent. God calls people. God calls people to minister to people. God chooses this the, these earthen vessels for His glory to do a work through us. Through us. Not in spite of us, hopefully. But in us and through us. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, we read about Abraham here in what has been called the Hall of Fame of Faith. Chapter 11 of Hebrews. And I would note that the first verse of chapter 12, we all know the verse about seeing that we are encompassed by such a great crowd of witnesses. I've heard it preached so often that, that people from the past were, were sitting in heaven watching what we did, but that's incorrect in context. Verse 1 of chapter 12 looks back on chapter 11. All the, those in the hall of fame of faith who bear witness to us of faith by their works that they did in faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it the elders obtained a good report. 
Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. When God spoke, the world was created. Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see those two things? You have to believe that God is. Isn't that your first crisis of faith? That God is. And if God is, does he reward those who seek him? Those who bear witness to us say yes. Yes and amen. And we look at the example of Abraham. Abraham's story, of course, is told in Genesis, in, uh, well, the book of Genesis. And retold bits and pieces of other places, including here in Hebrews 11. We know the story of Abraham, don't we? How he was given the promise. He who was childless in his elder years, along with his wife, Sarah. And it did not enter into his mind that it could happen. That they would yet have a child at that time. But they had no heir except a servant born in his house. And God gave Abraham a promise. I counted up the years there in Genesis. We, we can't account for all the years, but have you ever added up how long Abraham had to wait? Anybody? We're not told how many years from the time he got the promise until he tried to make it happen. So that, that is blank. That, I, that is an X in the formula. But then we can add to that what it tells us about Isaac. Uh, excuse me, Ishmael. We know the story of Ishmael. Abraham waited however long it was. And Sarah suggested to him. And it's actually a law that has been found carved in stone there in that region. That the lady of the house could give her handmaid to her husband as a surrogate uh, bearer of children. A surrogate mother. And that's what Sarah decided to do. You know, Sarah heard Abraham's promise. Sarah was privy to that that promise. But Sarah could not have Abraham's faith. When you're given the promise, no one else can have your faith. You have to have it. Amen? Sarah came up with a scheme to, to get the child. And she convinced Abraham to take Hagar, her maidservant. And they had a child. But it was not the child of promise. God help us all if we have an Isaac promise not to resort to an Ishmael solution. It says further of Abraham, verse 13, because in spite of faltering, he still held to the promise. Verse 13 says of all those born witness to in chapter 11 says, not having received the promises, Abraham had not received the promise yet. He, he did not live to see the full promise, which was to have many nations like the sand of the sea come from his lineage. He did see, live to see Isaac. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. God gives you a promise. And he calls upon you to believe something that is not of this world because it does not exist until God speaks it and it comes to pass. He calls you to have a vision of something you cannot see. To believe something no one else will believe. To rely on that even for your life decisions. And in spite of all who would doubt because no one else can believe for you. You have to you have to do it yourself. But Abraham began to grow in the fruit of faith. I'll explain that a little more as we go on. Abraham got more faith in one day. Verse 17. By faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Can you imagine? Abraham had the child of promise. But he heard God's call undeniably. He had learned to know God's voice and to know God's will in his life. And God said to take him 
and offer him on Mount Moriah as a sacrifice. And Abraham went to do it. But it says, verse 19, that he accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Abraham had no idea why God told him to sacrifice Isaac. He only knew God's voice. And he had come to trust God so much that even if he had to go through with killing Isaac with his own knife, the promise was still true. The promise was still true. Paul says, Romans 4, 17, God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as they were. Verse 21, fully persuaded that what God, what he, God, had promised, he was able also to perform. That is what God longs for in his people, that his people believe him so much they just trust him. They don't have to have it explained. They don't have to understand. They don't have to get what they expected from God. They just know God's voice and rest in it and doubt no more. God wants all of us to increase our level of faith. And I've been teaching about gifts. I was, well, I happened to, I, I was in the shower, good place to think. And I've been preaching about people receiving gifts and it occurred to me to wonder what gift the Lord might want to give me from, from the list. And it immediately came to me. I didn't hear a word necessarily, but it came to my mind. Maybe it was me, I don't know, but well, it's funny that it was not what I would have chosen as a pastor. What would I have chosen as a pastor? How about gifts of healings? I would love to be used more in healings. How about gifts of miracles, of powers? I'd like to do miracles. I'm not, I want to ask for a show of hands who wants to do miracles. But I, I would choose probably one of those. But what came to mind was gift of faith. Gift of faith. And it came to my mind in quick succession a, a, a series of applications from the Word of God and some under, more understanding than I've had of what the gift of faith was because there's confusion because it's vague in there what faith means. Faith means belief. But there's a gift of faith and there's also a fruit of faith which is not the same. And we're told the fruit of faith in Galatians 5.22 in 23, we have the list. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, or temperance. And yet, it's, they're not the same. The gift is not the same as the fruit. Gifts are things that are given and that, that are free. They're bestowed upon us, regardless of whether we have earned them or deserve them or not. Let's remember that when we seek gifts from God. While fruit are things that are grown, that are cultivated, that grow over time. And you might want to write some of these things down because these things the Lord is teaching me. Number one, gifts are something you do, not something you have. You can possess fruit, but a gift is something you do and exercise. Number two, it is the exercise of faith over time that works fruit of faith in us. It's the exercising of our faith. And when we're given a gift of faith, as I understand it, and maybe there are other forms of the gift of faith, but what was revealed to me was that a gift of faith was a message of something to believe, which we then must Believe as that belief exercises in us, refines us, puts us sometimes through the fire to believe, takes us through times of doubt and times when we, we just can't see how that promise could come true. It's a refiner's fire. It's a trying of our faith that works patience in us. And that gift of faith, which begins a process 
It's not an event that happens all of a sudden. It starts a process. It can be a cross to bear, a trial of faith, refining fire, and yet it works in us the fruit of faith over time, as it did in Abraham. And the gift of faith, as it was revealed to me, I believe, is number four. One is given a promise or a fact on which one must exercise belief and be stretched. Have to be stretched. And I have several subpoints below that. Because there are certain qualities, it, all gifts of faith were given might not cover all of these, but I believe these are generally true. A, it's something impossible, highly improbable, or unbelievable. A promise that looks impossible and is unbelievable. No, if we tell it, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's another point. If you tell it to someone else, they won't believe you. They might love you, they might respect you and think there must be something to it, but they will not really believe you. They can't have your faith in that. And so you really have to keep it to yourself for the most part and not tell it to people who will doubt. Just as Abraham, Sarah knew about the promise. But do you see Abraham going telling everybody, hey, I'm going to have a son even though I'm old and my wife is past childbearing bearing years. Do you see that happening? Who else would believe it? Abraham would become a laughing stock as he spoke the promise before people without faith. B, you must not make assumptions or fill in the blanks about all the details. My experience is that God will give you a word that is short and sweet, as we say. If we begin to, uh, to elaborate upon it, to embroider it with our imagination, we can actually develop false expectations from it. Don't we know this is true? Develop false expectations and even get off track, assuming things about what we're told and getting beyond what we were actually told. We just have to believe what we're told and wait. See, as I said, something no one else you tell will believe because no one can have this faith for you. I said I got ahead of myself. D, this is, this is big. Something that challenges you to the core to believe and keep believing. It will challenge you. It will be all you can do to hang on at times as, as and it depends a lot on how long it is. Remember how long it was with, and I forgot, I left off telling you all the calculation of Abraham's waiting period. But there was the one we don't know, the years we don't know, and then we're told that Ishmael came to be, to be 13 years old. And then Abraham was reminded after that that it would come soon that Sarah would bear the child of promise. So at least another nine months beyond that. We're talking at least 15 years waiting. And it will challenge us if we have to wait. Challenge you to your core. And that's part of the working of the gift of uh, the uh, fruit of faith is challenge to your core. Being shaken. E, as we see in Abraham's Example, you must not try to do it yourself because you can't. It can be that leaf you chase and can't catch. F, you'll be disappointed over time. You will think you just imagined it. You will think you missed it. You will think God forgot. You will think you were not worthy. G, the lesson is that you will just have to walk in what you have been told as long as it takes. You will have to live it. You are being called upon to, to breathe rarefied air, to soar with eagles in the realm of faith, to fly without a net, to stake life decisions on that word because you're called upon to believe. So it's a challenge. And yet God gives you a purpose, an insight upon what He has decided to do in your life. 
or the life of a loved one. That is the gift. And it is the waiting on the gift and the believing, the hanging on, the times when you give up and you have to be reminded, the times when you wish it had never given you hope because you have none anymore. And times when it's just too hard and you doubt yourself, you doubt you heard it, you doubt God cares, you feel like you just can't hold out anymore. If you're not careful, you will stumble. You will try to make up an Ishmael solution. You will do the wrong thing. You will make a mess that you might never clean up again like Abraham did with Ishmael. And yet God calls upon us to have faith. He gives us precious promises. Think about the promise though. Look at the promise Abraham got. God didn't say it would be easy, but that it would be glorious at the end. And God promises us gifts. Not all gifts are hard. Some of them are immediately glorious. Thank the Lord. Some of you have gifts of tongues. And it edifies the speaker. Amen? Amen, somebody? Please? Some of you interpret tongues and it edifies the body. And prophesy perhaps. It edifies the body. It brings sometimes a wound at first and we're chastised. But ultimately joy when we obey. When we repent. When we do whatever God says to do. And gifts of healings. How much do we long for healings to take place? And not just partial healings. Do we have faith to pray? And don't answer. I think I know what the answer, even in my heart, would be. Do we really have faith to pray and expect visible miracles and healings to take place? Or do we need more faith? Because it takes faith to exercise the gifts. It only takes a willingness to receive the gifts, but it takes faith to exercise them, as we've heard from some, mostly on Sunday nights, when we've, we've studied about times of interpretation and prophecy. And some found that it's, it's a leap of faith to go beyond where you've gone before. It can be scary to take that leap the first time, to risk being embarrassed, to risk making a mistake, to risk saying God says and you insert something from you in there. I believe God's church should be a place where we can not only seek gifts, but we can, we can make honest mistakes. And we have a safety net of the body where we're loved, where everyone else is in the same boat, where we don't have to worry about what people will think. That's how the church should be. A safe place to make honest mistakes. And maybe even a place where we can get forgiven for some that weren't so honest. But a safe place. A place of forgiveness. A place full of God's Spirit. Because this is the day of grace. This is the time when Jesus once again through His Spirit calls out to us and says, I want to gather you like chicks under my wings. He rose to the right hand of the throne of God so that He could provide gifts for His church. He's calling today. What was it He said this day was, sister? A day set aside for us. I didn't mention it, but I've got some more sermon CDs, I've got the one entitled Today. I preached on New Year's Day and I've got the one on God's reality. Feel free to pick those up. But as I spoke that on New Year's Day, that is, today's the day. Whatever today is, this is the day when God calls you to, to come and receive. And He's calling us to be willing to receive whatever He's got. And so as our sister in the booth puts on Worship music. It's holy ground that I picked out to start with there, Sister Owens. 
That was the right song today you sang too. Mm -hmm. This is holy ground. Mm -hmm. I went around this building. I prayed over this entire sanctuary. I don't know if it works, but it worked for me to anoint every pew, mm -hmm. to anoint the doorposts, to anoint the altars. Mm -hmm. Because this is holy ground. God wants to do a work here today, and I'm going to open these altars as Sister Janice plays worship music. If anyone is hungry and thirsts, let him come and drink. <laughs> 